Good morning. Welcome to this very special conversation with Nobel laureate Professor Daniel Kahneman. My name is Sandra Peter. I'm the director of Sydney Business Insights at the University of Sydney Business School. And before we begin our event, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners on the land on which the University of Sydney is also built. I acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices within this university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever with the Aboriginal custodianship of country. I am very pleased to be co-hosting today with my Perth-based colleague and longtime collaborator and friend of Professor Kahneman's, Professor Dan Lovallo. Dan's a professor of strategy, innovation and decision sciences at the University of Sydney Business School. And I will be handing over to um, Dan a little bit later. I am thrilled to announce the man who really needs no introduction, Professor Danny Kahneman, um, to our audience, thousands of people joining us today from over 65 countries. And Professor Kahneman is Professor of Psychology and Public Affairs Emeritus at Princeton University. Professor Kahneman's received almost every possible award for a psychologist and then some for economists as well for, for good measure, including the 2002 Nobel Prize in Economics. And Professor Kahneman is arguably the world's most influential living psychologist. It's hard to think of anyone whose work has influenced so, so many fields. His fellow Nobel laureate and our previous, uh, our previous guest, Richard Thaler, um, said uh, his work represents one of the most important accomplishments of 20th century science. Uh, Professor Kahneman is also the uh, best-selling author of Thinking Fast and Slow, and his latest book is Noise, A Flow in Human Judgment, which he um, co-authored with Olivier Siboney and uh, Cass Sunstein. Um, greetings, Danny. It's evening where you are, but here in Australia, we're very fresh. It's the morning and we are very keen to, to engage with you. My pleasure. Um, to everyone out there watching, you can still submit questions on Slido using the code, uh, the event code SBI2021 and many questions there already. But before going to audience questions, uh, let me start by asking you a couple of questions. Um, then it's been two years since you and I last spoke and it was in between the publication of Thinking Fast and Slow and your latest book, Noise. And in our conversation, you said something that stayed with me ever since. So I, I want to pick up where we left, where we left off. And we were talking, as I recall, about, about failure and how failures are routine in the academic work and, and in thinking work, yet we seldom talk about it. And you said, and I I I, I actually quote here, I actually I enjoy changing my mind. And the occasion for changing your mind is always when you find out that you've been wrong. And you said that for you, this was a real joy, finding out that you've been wrong, the discovery that you've learned something new. And that's the kind of stuff that makes work, work interesting. But there's very little emphasis in changing one's mind in general. And in politics and in business schools in particular, there's almost a stigma attached to it, which leaves us kind of unprepared for when the world changes or when we make research advances and we understand things better. So I want to focus on those exciting times in, in your career. Can you start by talking a bit about the pleasure of changing your mind? Well, uh, it sometimes drives my collaborators crazy because most of my work is collaborative and, and quite often, as they all will complain, um, you know, I, I announce that something is deeply wrong in the work that we've done. And sometimes we find a solution, sometimes even I find a solution. And, and those moments of even finding that I'm wrong, is there is some pleasure in that. There is, I feel I've learned something. I used to think something, and now I think something else. And then solving it is, is even more fun. But 
even when I solve it, I know that it's temporary and that uh, I will change my mind again. And yeah, it's clearly one of the, for me, it's one of the joys of, of work. It's the only time that I feel quite certain that I've learned something is when I look at what I used to think and I said, what an idiot, you know, how come I didn't see this before, which happens to me a lot. Um, one one area I've heard you reflect on is, is is the study of happiness, and you're responsible for convincing basically researchers that happiness is a real experience and it can be measured and therefore can be studied and understood. And I dare say you've you've made happiness both practical and respectable. Um, I know you've abandoned happiness as a focus, and you've stated that you're more interested in the study of of misery and you think it is more important for policies to be focused on how we reduce misery rather than improving happiness. Can you talk a bit about, about happiness? Um, can you talk a little bit about happiness and, and how and why you've changed your mind around this? Well, uh, I've changed my mind in multiple ways about happiness. Uh, one, there is a distinction that I drew and others have drawn between the experience of happiness and the satisfaction with life. And I used to think uh, that clearly how you think about your life and you know whether you're happy when you think about your life, that this is not very important. And that what is really important is the experience of life and it's being happy in real time. And I was quite convinced of that and, and that actually was the reason for my starting a, a whole research program on experience happiness was that I thought this would be more important than life satisfaction. And then it turned out that I had to change my mind because I found that actually happiness is not what people want. Uh, what they really want is life satisfaction. That is, they want to have a good story about their life much more than they want particular experiences of happiness. So uh, that, that was one reason for leaving the field. The emphasis on misery is less, you know, something about which I changed my mind because when I was working quite early, uh, we had something that we call the U index, the un unhappiness index, which is the time that, that you spend in a, in a miserable state. And as it happens, I'm working on just that problem again right now because somebody uh, failed to replicate the result of ours and, and we've been involved in a joint collaboration trying to figure things out. And I think we have. So it's an exciting topic for me these days. And also one that that our audience has been has been asking, and uh, my my question echoes that of Marcus and a few other people who um, who wanted to know how you, how your focus has shifted around around happiness. Um, let me let me keep that that focus on kind of big arcs in your career. And your career has always focused on the study of judgment and decision making, and what can be broadly described as, as main big, big effects. And you, that is to say, you've stayed fairly clear of looking at individual differences in, in particular. But recently I've, I've heard you remark on, on the fact that there seems to be value in, in studying individual differences. Can you talk a little bit about what made you rethink the need to do so or the value well, that might be found there? Uh, well, it didn't start with individual differences. It really started with noise. Uh, and the discovery that there is just a lot of disagreement among people when they make judgments, judgments where we'd expect them to agree and where, in a sense, every one of the people who make the judgment think they're right, and yet they disagree a lot. So that's noise, and that's the topic of uh, the book that we published earlier this year. Now the measure of noise is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation of judgment. And then there is a, a really striking observation is that when we talk about studying judgment, uh, we mean studying means, studying averages. That is you set up conditions and you look at the mean judgment or decision in this condition, in that condition. It turns out that we don't look at standard deviations. And 
Uh, that's something that I plan to ask. I'm, I plan to address a letter to the judgment and decision-making community, asking them to look at their own results and to look at the standard deviations. And maybe there is something interesting that happens in differences among conditions in standard deviation. Now, one of the aspects of studying noise is individual differences. Why do people differ? So, and, and there are some dimensions that we know, but my guess is that most of noise will remain unexplained. That is, that there are just differences among people and that there are so many differences and so subtle that we're not going to be able to explain much of the variance, much of the noise variance, but it's worth trying and I'm interested in it. And it's um, true that I never had any interest in individual differences, so it's, it's, uh, it is new for me. Um, and speaking of, of new things, you've, you've taken us to noise, so I'll, I'll pick up on a couple of the audience questions here because people have been asking about where, where noise matters the most. So where does noise matter in general, but where does it matter most? Well, you know, it matters in socially important decisions. So in general, we have organizations and it's the organization that speaks. So if you have an in, an insurance company and you have underwriters setting premiums for policies, they speak for the organization. When you have judges setting sentences, they speak for the justice system. And there is something really unfair and, and really undesirable when an organization does not speak in one voice and that's noise. And when the, so where it's most important, clearly in the domain of justice and sentencing, obviously we don't want noise. In the domain of medicine, we obviously we don't want noise and yet we find a lot of it. And, and I think that noise is a problem for many organizations which produce judgment. And that's true for, you know, it's true for insurance companies, it's true for banks, it's true for lenders, it's true for investors. And each of these organizations has individuals who make particular decisions on its behalf. And if these individuals typically do not agree with each other, then the organization has a problem. But where it's most important is on vital decisions, like how many years will somebody spend in prison or what is the proper treatment for a particular disease or a particular patient. Just picking up some, on some more audience questions, because Simon's asking, how, how should we deal with noise? How should organizations, how should individuals deal with noise? Uh, well, um, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm hesitating because I say, read our book. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time in, in our book on, it's actually a much more prescriptive book than Thinking Fast and Slow was. Uh, in, in that because it is addressed to organization, uh, I'm more optimistic about the possibilities of organizations improving their decision making. So we have uh, what we call some recommendations for what we call decision hygiene. And decision hygiene, well, when you have biases, and we talk about reducing biases, it's like a disease and treating a disease, you do that with vaccines or you do that with medications, but they're specific to the disease. And what is the contrast between that and hygiene is that when you're washing your hands, you don't know what germs you're killing. And, you know, and if you're lucky, you'll never know. And, and so there are procedures of good, how to make good judgments and how to make better decisions, not good, but better judgments, better decisions. And, and we know quite a bit about that, not enough to, to guarantee that good decisions would be made, but there are st several steps that can be taken, like breaking up problems, making judgments relative, uh, aggregating judgments, keeping judgments independent of each other statistically. So there are many, steps, decision hygiene can be uh, worked out in some detail. Maria is asking if there's a place where noise 
where we want noise, where noise is a good thing, where we might want individual differences? Well, you know, our definition of noise is that it's variability that you don't want. So by definition, noise is bad, but vari variability is often very good. I mean, so clearly you want a lot of variability when, when there is a possibility for selection. So the engine of, of evolution is noise. So there is variability and then the fittest gets selected. And then there are variability in many contexts is, is the spice of life. You don't really want, you know, all your film critics to agree with each other. And you don't want all the participants in a discussion to agree with each other. So there are many situations where we actually want variability. Uh, we want variability in the context of creativity of looking for solutions, but there are contexts where we don't want variability. And that's where we call variability noise. And we try, we think it should be reduced. And, and echoing comments by, by David and, and others in chat, by the way, I'm, I'm looking at the other screen, just seeing the questions come in. Um, so let me, we've, we've, we've spoken a bit about definitions here and, and when we want certain things and when we don't. Um, I want to I want to take you to, to um, social psychology a bit and the fact that in, in quite a few fields we're discovering that a lot of what we've taken for granted, um, and I'm talking here especially about the very sexy theories and, and, and finding, it's not quite as we thought, so, so weaker effects and sometimes not quite replicable, maybe even false. And you've shown very early concerns with some of the results in, in social psychology, especially priming studies, some studies that show that there are dramatic influences of, of minor kind of irrelevant aspects of a situation. And you wrote a letter to your colleagues almost a decade ago in which you warned of a um, looming train wreck. And that train wreck was the crisis of replication in social psychology, and that has since spread to other disciplines as well. Can you talk a little bit about what the, this crisis meant for the field, and where do you think we are today? Well, uh, you know, the crisis meant very different things for, for people in different areas. Um, what the, the most important thing that I think has happened is that there has been almost a revolution in psychology, and it's happening incredibly fast in terms of improving the methodology of research. So just a lot of procedures have been introduced within the last eight years that change the way that people do research. And, you know, I can feel it myself. And when we're involved in research, we're thinking ahead. We're pre-registering our research. We're computing power, we are really being very careful about specifying our methods. So the, when you look at the replication crisis, the main thing that stands out eight years later is what a huge benefit this has been to the science. And psychology is just a much better field now than it was 10 years ago. And this is be, because of that train wreck, actually. Um. Speaking of, of, the, of, of the train wreck, let me, let me follow that up with the fact that um, so I, I, I want to hear a bit about how we retire ideas out there. So how, how do we unlearn some of the stuff that's out there? Because many of these ideas and then social psychology, is, is, social psychology ideas are, are a prime example. Many of them are still out in TED Talks, in thought leadership pieces and, and, and the like. And many policymakers and, and managers still rely on them. And they're still quite ingrained in, in public consciousness. And I'm also going to um, attach Le Leanne's question here, which, which says that you know, they, these things live on in, in, in businesses. How do, we, how do we retire them? And what are our responsibilities also as academics around that? I mean, you know, we have no solution to this problem, I think, except, you know, uh, textbooks should be should should adapt, and I am sure that they are adapting. The problem, actually, with the sexy findings that have proved non-replicable, is that uh, there is limited appeal to books that say that something isn't true. 
especially if something exciting that you wanted to believe in is not true. This is not news that, that there is a lot of demand for. So, Chicken soup is not really good for depression, is not a, is not a catchy title. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, so you're asking, what can we do to retire ideas? I have no idea. Uh, we, you know, let's hope that there are better ideas uh, that come up and capture the imagination of people. But otherwise, you know, you need, I think, you need some texts that are widely read and that will correct some of the mistakes that were made. For example, Thinking Fast and Slow had a chapter on priming, which, which you know, I wish I hadn't written. So, uh, and somebody will write a, a better book and that, that will be new and that, so things will be corrected, but you have to wait until there is a replacement for those sexy findings because the people want to believe them. Well, at the, at the business school, we're you know we're we're on TED talking and we're we're on learning things. But I I, I really want to to echo your thoughts there because it, it is really really difficult. I mean, if if I think of your work with with Amos Tversky, you've provided the basically foundational work for, for behavioral economics. And you've shown economists just how far people depart from the fictional creatures in, in economic models. And it's difficult to stress just how big a departure that was from, from mainstream economics, from the core premise that you know, people optimize and people are rational and respond to incentives. And um, Richard even coined the, the term econs. But for all your tremendous success, and you do a, a lot of public talking, you write public books, for all the tremendous success of your work and Richard's and 40 years of, of research, Homo economicus is still the, the, the dominant species. And this model still has a tremendous influence. And economists never have to start a book by explaining homo economicus, yet even though it's obvious that people suffer from all the self-control and all the kinds of emotions that affect their behavior, humans is still the first chapter in every one of the behavioral economics books. Um, how do we let go of, of then homo economicus? How do we unlearn rational homo economicus as the exception rather than, than the rule? And what's What's the secret to changing people's minds about that? Well, you know, I think there are certain, there are, you know, that's, that's a difficult topic. So there are many things to say about it. But I would say, first of all, that homo economicus should not be retired. Uh, the, as if you are going to, uh, what, if you try to predict what markets will do and aggregate behavior and you need a representative agent, in order to make the treatment mathematically treatable, tractable, uh, you are not going to do much better than to assume that people are rational and that they act in their self-interest. And so the idea of retiring that model is, uh, we, don't, we don't need to retire that model. There's, what is remarkable, I think, is that economic students are introduced to that model as if that is the model and not as if this is an approximation. But many people, I think this is actually getting into the culture and we cannot really complain about the, the discipline of economics being rigid because if prospect theory was a challenge and it appeared in 1979, 25 years later, there were Nobel prizes and, and Clark medals given to behavior Economists, there have been several uh, in the meantime. So uh, e economics has been surprisingly flexible and open to, to the behavioral input, much more than you know, I would have expected in the early 80s, judging by the initial reaction to our work. But- uh, What was that initial uh, reaction? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, it, it, people thought that this was absurd. And what they thought was absurd was the idea of systematic errors. So there was a concept that errors are random and nobody really believed that people are rational all the time. What they did believe is that uh, 
there is no use in looking for errors because they're random. The idea of systematic errors was a big challenge and it was really soundly rejected by many people early on. There were people who didn't believe that it was possible to have a theory of errors because the idea of building a theory on logic was so deeply ingrained in, in economics that, you know, I, I mean, I distinctly remember an article that appeared in the early 80s and said, you know, what sort of nonsense is it to try to have a, a theory of error? Impossible. So that's been a big change. Let me take you to another big, big change, because that's something you've changed all our minds uh, about, or, or indeed you should. Um, and that's, that's intuition. It's Intuition is, is one of those things that we most often talk about in terms of its, of its benefits. It has kind of some kind of a mythical aura and always had some kind of mythical aura around it. And your work has gone a really long way to say that we need to kind of unlearn the common sense way in which we rely on, on, on intuition, which is this automatic kind of unexamined, unexamined way. And there have been quite a few questions around intuition coming in on, on Slido as well. So um, people saying, you know, they rely on on Intu on the intuition, people like Jack, how, how can we avoid this? But then why is intuition so seductive and how should we think of, of, of intuition? Well, you know, intuition is sometimes defined, which seems crazy to me, but it's sometimes defined as knowing without knowing how you know. But it's not knowing really, it's feeling that you know something without knowing why what you feel that you know. It's, when you say that it's knowing, you're assuming that it's true. And what is really the case is that intuition is a, is a strong feeling that something is true. And, and, and it's a difficulty in imagining any alternative. So it comes with high confidence. Now, uh, I really want to stress that most of the time, we act on intuition. So, you know, in terms of fast thinking and slow thinking, most of the time we're in fast thinking mode and most of the time it works extremely well. So uh, now there are, when it comes to more complex problems, there are situations in which even in complex problems, expert intuition can be trusted. So I, you know, one of my friends and collaborators is uh, Gary Klein, who, whose line is he believes in intuitive expertise or in expert intuition, and he's written very eloquently about it. And in fact, he really doesn't like any of the work that I have done that, that pushes against it. But he and I agreed on the conditions under which there is expertise and a, intuitive expertise and other conditions under which you shouldn't rely on your expertise. And, you know, there are three conditions. The world has to be regular. You have to have had a lot of practice and the practice must have involved fairly rapid feedback. If those three conditions are satisfied in a particular domain, intuitions in that domain are likely to develop and to be valid. If they're not satisfied, any of those is enough for intuition not to, not to be expert intuition. People will still have them. People have intuitions about which stocks will go up or down in the stock market, and they shouldn't, but because the stock market is not regular. So uh, it's a nuanced message. It's not that you, know, you want to resist intuition wherever. You want to be suspicious of it in a certain class of problems. And Organizations have an opportunity to resist intuitions because organizations live on slow thinking relatively. And so they can, uh, they can question intuition and individuals should question intuitions under some conditions where they know or should know that, that they're susceptible to illusions, to cognitive illusions or to emotional illusions. Then they should slow down and get advice or slow down and think, but it's not that, I, I was very careful actually in, in writing Thinking Fast and Slow not to speak against intuition, 
I said it's marvelous and it's flawed and we should know when it's marvelous and when it's flawed. So the best way to think about intuition, to sleep on it, wait a bit? Uh, well, it depends what. On simple problems, when we have a lot of experience, just trust it. But which we do anyway, when the stakes are high and, you're, and when you look at, at it, you see that the conditions for confidence are not there, that actually you don't have evidence for what you feel is true. And it's important then slow down and you know sleep on it. Sleeping on it may not be enough, get advice, uh, think slowly. Let me take one, one audience question that, that many people have been uh, very interested in. And that is uh, from, from Billy on, on what, how do you see the role of, of um, uh, machine learning and, and algorithms in helping out um, with whether it's our reliance on intuition or noise? How do you see the role of, of machine learning and, um, and algorithms, AI, in, in this? Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's been known for quite a while that, that human judgment is inferior to even simple rules. So when the data are available, and even without data, you quite often can do better than people and in making judgments. And this is mainly actually because of noise because people are unreliable. And so anything that is reliable, simple rules, regression equations, and certainly artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to be superior. What is interesting and important is that in a domain where there is a lot of data, humans, I think, really don't have a chance. I mean, so they we have the example of chess, which is an interesting example. So Gary Kasparov, after he was defeated by Deep Blue, he didn't like the way that Deep Blue played chess. And, and he suggested that the winning combination would be a human grandmaster and a computer. It's not true anymore. The current software that plays chess beats the world champion easily. And they don't need people. Actually, human knowledge is, gets in the way. The way to program machine learning in chess is to start from the beginning with no knowledge, start almost at the pixel level or with the rules. So this is going to be true in any domain. When machines approach human performance, it's a question of very little time and they will exceed human performance. So, you know, I think this is coming in, in diagnostic problems. It is coming in, in some legal domains where uh, machines are just going to be better. And it's going to be quite interesting when it gets to really complex things like the kinds of business judgments that CEOs make, whether machine learning, you know. Uh, one thing that I, I have doubts about is the ability of people to cooperate usefully, to collaborate with machines. We can use machines, but when they are competing with us, when they're making the same judgments that we are making, they're just going to make it better than we do. And getting used to that is going to be painful. Pain ahead. Um, one, one last question for, for our audience, and we'll come back to questions from our audience at, at, at the end. But uh, John's asking, what's intrigued you most over the, last, uh, over the last couple of years? What have you learned? What's the most important thing you've learned over the last couple of years? And I think he's uh, reflecting on, on since, since pandemic times rather than since last you and I spoke. I see. Uh... That's a hard question because my memory doesn't work very well and, and it doesn't work that way. So <clears throat> it would be, yeah, I won't be able to, to think of a fact that I have learned that, you know, that I would consider the most important. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, there are really exciting things that are happening in, in neuroscience and the developments there are very rapid. Uh, and that's exciting. And there are really interesting developments in machine learning and, and in, in the interaction and in machine learning predicting objective criteria and 
any machine learning analyzing human judgments. So those are the, I can, I can specify that I, the work of Sendil Mullenathan uh, is some, some of the work that I've found the most exciting uh, over the last couple of years and several, several neuroscientists uh, I've found really exciting. Speaking, speaking of, of other scientists, your career has had collaboration at, at, at its heart and your collaboration with, with Amos Tversky, but also with other people like, like Richard Thaler is the stuff of academic legend, um, as well as a book and many articles and uh, likely movies very soon. Um, so I, I think it's time, over to, it's time to hand over to one of your collaborators of, dare I say, the last um, 30, 30 years. Um, this is my colleague, uh, uh, Dan Lovalo, who was also one of your students. And I do believe he gave up Richard Taylor to, to work with you at Berkeley. Um, so Dan, um, take it away. Hello. Uh, yes, we started collaborating when I was five. Uh, it was, uh, it's uh, been wonderful. I'm now 35 and looking good. Uh, Danny, you talked about, this is a quick two-parter, you talked about um, your collaborations a little bit and that you like to change your mind. And one time we had a conversation and I said, okay, I understand you like to change your mind. Uh, I, I don't think we've ever written a paper that took less than a year, even if it was a Harvard Business School type paper. And you said, yeah. And I said, well, what about when you change your mind back again? And you said, that's when I like it the most. <laughs> Could you explain that to our audience? And uh, also, uh, who have you inflicted that the most pain on? <laughs> Actually, I think it almost never happens in the sense that I, I have the feeling that changing my mind is a cumulative process and that mm -hmm. even when I manage to go back to the previous formulation, it has a twist. I have learned something from finding a flaw in it. So it is a pleasure to discover, oh yes, I, I was right in the big scheme of things, but I have to add this piece to, to make it work. That's the way in which I go back. It's not just ignoring, you know, going back and forth. That, that actually rarely happens. And, and how do your collaborators find this? My collaborators uh, have to have a lot of patience and, uh, and they, they do. I mean, you know, by and large, my collaborations have been so friendly and they have been with friends. And so they learn to tolerate me and, uh, and they ignore me sometimes when necessary or well, they make fun of me and, and ultimately we get things done very slowly. I mean, I, I, as, you, as you pointed out, I'm not very fast. And uh, what makes you determine whether, uh, you know, you want to collaborate with someone? Obviously, uh, it's, not a, it's not a dating scene. It's uh, you read other people's work, you like people's work. Um, uh, but does there have to be an element of funny in it? In other words, I don't think I've ever worked with you and not had a day of laughter. Yeah, I mean, it, that, that is true. I mean, all my collaborations have been fun. Uh, I mean, they've been social fun. And there is, I, I've, I've liked the social element um, through my career, actually. The most vivid was with Emma Swirsky, but you know, I've collaborated with you, I've collaborated with Dick Thaler. I mean, with Dick Thaler, obviously you laugh all the time, uh, but, but it's been true in most of them that some, some pattern of humor and banter developed that was part of, uh, part of the experience, so. Um, the... I'm, I'm conscious of time and also want to uh, bring the, the younger people and the students that are watching in and get, uh, get some advice. If you were starting today, what topics would you 
be interested in? Well, I mean, it's sort of obvious what I'm going to say. I mean, I, the, and it could be wrong because I'm going to talk about the topics where there has been the most progress within the last right. decade or so. And obviously in my area, it's artificial intelligence and neuroscience. So I would be torn between those two if I were starting. But, but you know, young people may know more than I do. I'm actually looking back at. Mm -hmm. And it's true that in both of these areas, there has been a big influx of talent. So very bright, smart people have moved into these fields. And when you have such a thing, it's almost guaranteed that the next 10 or 20 years, there's going to be very good work in these fields. Uh, and this, this we can be quite sure of. Any of it scary? Mm -hmm. Any of it scary? Yeah, it is. Um, this is this is a curveball, um, but uh, you wrote "Thinking Fast and Slow" with two characters, uh, Type One and Type Two, and uh, Freud wrote with one could say three characters: the yeah. id, the ego, the super ego. Uh, do you consider Freud's psychology in if so, in what way? Well, uh, or young, you have to take your pick. I, I never did consider Freud part of, of psychology. I mean, psychology for me was mainly a method and Freud didn't follow that method. So uh, he had psychological insights, which were very profound and so on, but I never saw, I never saw felt that uh, my discipline overlapped with, with what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've heard interesting talks with you and Yuval, and I, I apologize, I'm not good at pron pronouncing. Oh, so. are we? Yes. Um, yeah. Do you think the end of humans is close? <laughs> Ish. Uh, you know, Halawi makes that argument, and, uh, and and he makes it he makes it very powerfully. But even he is tongue in cheek. I mean, the one thing that we do know is that forecasting doesn't work. So, uh, and but what do you, what that's do you the mean one thing we can We can't pay to forecast things. What do you? What do I, you know. <laughs> I know. I uh, know. But if you're forecasting short term. It's a good, right. yeah, that can work. And if you get paid for that, you can earn your money. But being paid for forecasting long trends like the end of humanity or whether how humans and artificial intelligence will work together or whether chips will be implanted in our brains, all of this stuff, uh, it's not that it won't happen. It's just that we don't know what will happen. Like 50 years ago, we had no idea of what was going to happen to us in the last 50 years. Do you, do you have any um, sense whatsoever uh, about um, the forecast people are making at conferences like COP about what their government will do in uh, 2050 to reduce emissions while this year simultaneously subsidizing, for example, in Australia, we're subsidizing coal and promising to reduce emissions. Well, uh, you know, climate change is really just about the worst topic for humankind. Uh, you know, it's it's got it's remote, it's abstract, it's contested, it's uncertain, uh, and those are kinds of risks that people find very difficult to cope with. And the conflict between long-term and short-term is so salient uh, yeah. that actually, in some ways, I'm impressed by how much has been accomplished. I mean, it's in that sense, it's been better than I expected and it's still awful and going to get worse. But I had expected even worse. 
and you know there there are there are big changes in emissions. Now they're inadequate, they're insufficient, but things have been happening, and I'm sure things are happening in Australia, and and it's all in the right direction. It's just probably not going to be enough. Uh, that's the way it looks now. That's the way it looks after that meeting. But I'm talking completely out of my area of experience. Well, not, not necessarily in the sense that, uh, you know, it's a long-term problem. You got to bite it off and eat bit-sized pieces and heads of government are going to be dead before, well, at least if they're my age or older, before anything happens. Uh, uh, it's a bad problem. <laughs> um, for, for, for humans, the way that we are built, it's not a yeah. good problem. Yeah. Um, an invasion from Mars would be an invasion, you know, that would right. be something that, uh, or even a, an asteroid coming to Earth with a right. particular date of arrival, and we would mobilize for that. <laughs> Climate change just doesn't have the necessary characteristics for humanity to mobilize. So we need, we need some someone nice and uh, aliens to send us a note and say, you've got until. Something like that, yeah. Um, are there any thoughts at your age that you still don't share? So what in other mean? words, well, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, issues surrounding uh, Me Too and uh, wokeness and things like that. And, uh, and uh, Danny's not shy, he's 87, um, uh, that you still will fix yourself. Uh, well, I mean, like you know, have to correct yourself. I, I'm, well, you know, I'm, as you pointed out, I mean, you know, I'm very old and, and my ideas are, you know, haven't caught up. So uh, the, there is a lot that I find the walk culture is alien to me. I can recognize, you know, where it comes from, but some of it just strikes me as, uh, as extreme and unreasonable. And I think that I can see that this is the way it almost has to happen. That is that you have to have those big swings in order to achieve anything. But uh, yes, you know, I, I know, the woke culture is not mine. It never will be. It belongs to another generation. And, and they don't expect me to share their opinion and they don't care. And it's just, it's just as well. Jewish people in France uh, at a certain point in time in the uh, mid 20th century, early to mid 20th century, didn't have the best time of it. Uh, and um, I would think you would have, con compared to privileged people in America, I would, I would suspect that you might be dismissive, but uh, perhaps that's not the case. Dis dismissive? Yeah. I would, uh, you guys might be kind of whining a little bit too much about uh, not so much. But, uh, uh, look, look, I mean, a lot of the stuff is alien to me. Uh, yeah. and, and I feel... You know, I feel something shocked me, mm. and 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 when I'm shocked, I'm not entirely sure uh, whether it's my fault or their fault. But, for example, the the American Psychological Association published an apology for their contribution to systemic racism, and I think I'm not sure that they had in mind intelligence testing. IQ mm. testing. Now, that is hard for me to swallow. Yeah. Now, you know, IQ testing is being questioned and so on, but I have, I grew up with it as one of the major achievements of psychology and, and as one of the major achievements in trying to predict. I know that it can be misused. I know that there are problems, but the wholesale giving up on it, uh, yes, I find it shocking. And at the same time, I know 
that my grandmother found shocking many things that I did and thought and believed and that had very little effect on me. And I don't expect my being shocked to have much influence. One great piece of luck of mine, obviously, was, was getting to know you, but I had a second piece of luck uh, built in there, which was, uh, could you explain how you and Amos uh, uh, collaborated given the hours you kept at the time? Well, uh, we, what was it, you know, <laughs> He was a night person and I was a sort of a morning person. So we shared the afternoons and, uh, and that was, we spent all our afternoons together and he had the night to work by himself and I had the morning to work by myself and that worked. Uh, that was, it, it happened to work quite well. It left us time to, to work on, our, to do our own thing. Well, at the same time, our joint work was really the center of what we were doing. This paid off for me in the sense that you never woke me up in the morning, but you would think nothing of a Friday night, uh, one was single and you know might be on a date. You had to call at 1.30 a.m. Did I do call. that? Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize, Dan. I... Oh, no. <laughs> It, I must have felt it was very important. <laughs> it was. It was, it, was, it, was, it, was new, it was new data. It was new data, so, which, is, which is always the most fun. This is the kind of stories that improve over time, I hope. <laughs> well, uh, people got a kick out of it then. Yeah. Um, you're still working. Uh, I mean, yeah. as a matter of fact, we're doing a little, you know, uh, with a with consulting company. I think we've lost Dan in mid-sentence. We've lost Dan, yes. We have lost Dan. That's okay. I'll, um, I'll, I'll turn to a couple of more audience questions while, while we wait for Dan to, um, to, get, his, to get his internet, uh, internet back on. Um, can I say, some, quite a few people have been asking about, about biases and, and how problematic they have been in this era of, of social media. And that's uh, Tian and Kieran and a few other people have, have asked questions around how can we remedy this? And, and if there's some practical advice that you can give um, people to improve their judgments in this information saturated world driven by creative truth telling. Well, I mean, Clearly we have a choice. This is empty advice. I don't really have anything useful or original to say about it. We all make choices about the information that we're exposed to. And, and a lot of this is that we expose ourselves to information that we expect to be comfortable, that we expect to be comfortable with. And that is really the process by which opinions get polarized and so on. And given the business models of you know, major tech firms like Google and Facebook, it looks extremely difficult to imagine how they could do otherwise than what they're doing. And they're clearly uh, a feeding polarization. And the psychological mechanism is that what people find most interesting is somebody who agrees with them, but is a little more extreme. This is what we really like to hear. And if that's the process, the algorithm will find it and it will pull people apart. This is almost mechanical. And it's very difficult to imagine Facebook or Google not having an algorithm that, that will do that. So I don't know what the solution is. And as for advice for it to individuals, it's useless to give advice to individuals on that topic, you know. Uh, let me let let me ask you one more question uh, from from um, our audience, which is looking at it's been one of the most popular questions, which is asking you about your view on on education systems and and how they are or are not uh, teaching uh, people to think more more critically and how can they think better. What is your your advice? Well, I don't know enough to, to have good advice on that. Um, it's sort of interesting that, you know, when one would think that the curriculum in high schools 
uh, should have a lot of critical thinking in it. Deliberate should have uh, some statistics in it, some probability. It, it's a bit odd that these uh, do not belong to the curriculum. I, I find it surprising, but I know too little about education to be able to comment. Uh, it, it seems, yeah, I, th I do think there is a fair amount of, of room for improvement uh, on, on what we emphasize and what we don't. But it's all going to involve trade-offs. I mean, we're going to give up things. If, if we were to introduce a serious emphasis on critical thinking and on the form of thinking rather than on content, and we would have to change the curriculum. We would have, you know, teacher training would have to change. All of this is going to be slow and difficult uh, if it happens. But in principle, I think the population could be better educated about critical thinking. Although I should point out that the evidence that education prevents polarization of, of opinions is weak or in fact negative. It's absolutely unclear whether edu mere, merely educating people makes, makes for a more coherent and cohesive uh, body politic and, uh, and makes for more agreement. So it's, I'm not sure that teaching critical thinking would cause people to agree with each other and to be more sensible than they are now. And one last question, maybe then then can make it back to um, to award the prize. But one one last question. Um, people people say that you're 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 an optimist, even though I've heard you many times say 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 otherwise. But um, is they're, they're asking if optimism or indeed pessimism is a learned choice or is it a natural inclination? Oh, I mean, I, I think the evidence is very clear that optimism is largely genetic. And, you know, and it's a very useful trait to have. I'm personally a pessimist because my mother was. So uh, and I'm a cheerful pessimist and that I think. So cheerful pessimists are very rarely disappointed, but on the whole, being an optimist is better. Optimists are happier and they get more done. Um. Danny, thank you so, so much for, for chatting with us today. I'll give it one more minute for, for Dan to come back, but I, I just want to say while, uh, while, while we hear that if, if you've enjoyed this uh, conversation about changing the way you think we think about the world, um, you can always subscribe to, to the Unlearn Project, our new podcast series all about changing your mind and change your common sense, why robots are coming to make your job harder, why big, why small is the new big and what music is for. And then it's shown us how an engaged life is basically a series of unlearning opportunities from what happiness is to what intuition and, and noise are. And in the process, he's helping us all think a little bit better and changing our minds with you has been, has been a real joy. And you can subscribe to the online project wherever you get your good podcasts. Then it's been such a pleasure to, to have you. As I said in our last chat, I do hope next time it is in, in actual person. Um, Dan, one last, if you're out there, this is a bit of a seance. Dan, if you're out there, if you can hear us, come back and award the prize. <laughs> Dan does not seem. Thank you so much to, to, to Dan Lovalo and thank you, Dan Kahneman, and thank you all for spending your morning or your, your evening with us. We hope to see you again next time. Thank you, and I will definitely listen to your podcast. I, I will be a subscriber. Bye. Sarah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Danny. Bye. Bye.